Welcome to AWARE. We are dedicated to communicating information that inspires your positive growth and change. Are you interested in a peaceful planet? Are you interested in optimal health? Are you living with purpose? Are you enjoying your life? We realize each person can make a difference, and our mission is to empower your awareness. The choices that you make in every moment shape your life, and we encourage you to realize that you have your own answers and to always listen to your own truth. We invite you to stay aware. Hello, and welcome to The Aware Show. I am Lisa Gar. Now, if I told you it was easy to reverse the aging process and to have a really fit body and a clear thinking and get fabulous, restful sleep, and a great memory, would you believe me? Have you noticed that over the past maybe year, year and a half, that you're looking more into Zoom or into mirrors and because of the stress we've all been through, have you seemingly felt that the aging process has been accelerated? We are talking today about a natural, incredible way to reverse and slow down that aging process in a way that also helps you relax a lot more and enjoy the present moment a lot more because that really is what it's all about. Stress is really the result of so many things that we don't like. So joining me are two people that are fabulously qualified to talk about this. One of them, Deborah Poneman, she's 120 years old, but she looks like she's 50. She has been teaching meditation to her and her Yes to Success courses around the world for 45 years. Tens of thousands of people have benefited from her knowledge and techniques and how to live optimally, successfully, healthy, happy, and um, very, very profound in their inner silence. And Ronnie Newman is an award-winning Harvard-trained mind-body researcher with decades of experience lecturing and teaching around the world. She's been published in numerous peer-reviewed journals and about the same thing, the power of meditation, breath, and other modalities to decrease stress, increase happiness, clarity, longevity, and slow down and even reverse mental and physical decline. Those are such good things. Wow, gives me just chills to even say those things. Welcome, Deborah. (laughs) Thank you, Lisa. It is so good to be here talking about one of my favorite topics, which is how to reverse the aging process. Well, you apparently have done a great job. <laughs> yes, like I can say, I'm 120, 120. Yes, 120. <laughs> and Ronnie Newman, Ronnie, uh, you have been doing this for a long time, teaching around the world. And I'd love to know, first of all, how did you two meet? How did you two connect on this topic? Ah, uh, Deb, you want to take it away? Yes, I will tell that story. So we oh. met. Uh, almost 50 years ago, when we were both students at Washington University in St. Louis, that was in the early 1970s, I was already involved in one of the most important anti-aging activities, and that is I was a meditation teacher. I had just gotten back from TM teacher training, and I started a TM club on the Washington University campus, and Ronnie was a brand new meditator, and she would show up at the meditation meetings. Oh, and I have to interrupt that Deborah would bribe us to come to those meetings by bringing Chips Ahoy chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> Good idea. Which we would never eat now, but ignorance now, is bliss. Now they know. <laughs> Now we know that it ages us, but back then it was a good way to get them to come. Anyway, we became friends and we always talked about how one day we'd like to teach together. So fast forward for decades, I continued teaching meditation to thousands and Ronnie not only taught meditation, but as you stated in her bio, she devoted much of her life to research beginning at Harvard on how meditation and the breath and other lifestyle choices can affect not only our well-being, but the aging process. And then, and we've seen each other at a lot of meditation courses over the years. We now both teach through the Art of Living Foundation, and so we're very uh, happy we teach some courses together. But about a year and a half ago, we were in India, and we were at an Ayurvedic center at the Sri Sri Ravi Shankar Ashram, and we were having treatment, surprise, surprise, for health and longevity. Great. <laughs> we were there for a month. 
but we were sharing with some friends what we thought was common knowledge about diet and exercise and sleep. I mean, things that we thought people knew that they could do to slow down the aging process and literally turn back the hands of time. And we realized that people don't know this stuff. And we just said at the ashram, we said, okay, that's it. We have to put together a course. We have to teach people, especially about slowing the aging process of the brain because senior moments, like why did I walk in this room? They are not inevitable and don't think that they are. So first of all, I would love to find out, maybe Ronnie, you could tell me what does stress do to the aging process? Ah, well, if you wanted to think of probably the single greatest thing uh, that causes aging, it would be stress. Mm. So what stress does to the aging process is it um, kickstarts it and it makes it a superpower. Stress is a superpower for aging. And there's two reasons that it's important for people to know about why stress ages people so much. The first of which is that one of the best biomarkers of aging is something called telomere length. And tell, a lot of people have heard about telomeres, a lot of people have not. It was actually the subject of the Nobel Prize because what happens when we age, there's something called a telomere that shrinks every time a cell divides. And a telomere is the end of the strands of our DNA. And you know, if you think of a shoelace and that little hard tip at the end of the shoelace, that's like the telomere. And every time the cell divides, that telomere becomes infinitesimally shorter. That's what ages us. And stress increases the shortening of the telomeres and it produces more rapid aging and premature death. So that's part of what stress does for our system. That's why so, we definitely want to avoid stress. What is it about the DNA that shortens it and how and why does the shorter telomere contribute to the aging? Well, what we know is that the telomere, every time we have an emotion, whether it's stress or anxiety or negative, emo well, no emotions are really negative, but we'd say the undesirable ones, the ones we wish we never had. Mm -hmm. So those undesirable emotions, as well as the desirable emotions, every emotion that we have produces a, a a cascade of chemicals, biological changes, chemical changes in the body. And it happens in a split second automatically. And those chemical messengers are actually called neuropeptides. Those chemical messengers are rapidly picked up by the cells. They're transmitted there everywhere through the body. So our emotions are not just here, they're not just in our head, but they're everywhere in our body and they're transmitted there almost instantaneously by these chemical messengers. And stress causes the release of cortisol and other chemical messengers, which speed up the aging process. And that's why we really wanna get our stress levels under check. I would say that's probably the number one thing I would recommend for getting our stress levels under check. So if we have already gone through this much stress in our lives, is it possible to, um, undo some of the aging that we have done, especially this last year? Do you just feel that a lot of us have just looked in the mirror and at Zoom and not liked what we've seen? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because what we find is that the, the, the rate of the telomere shrinking decreases and telomeres actually sometimes start to grow back. Oh, and there is, see, there's another chemical, not to get too much in. I mean, I love it, but I don't want to bore people in the audience. But there's something called telomerase, which protects the telomere. It's another chemical in the body. And when we get our stress levels under check, and more importantly, when we um, increase activity in the well being part of our nervous system, then the telomeres actually they, they, they uh, shorten more slowly. And sometimes they even start to grow back. Okay. And that's biology, it's not philosophy. So Deborah, you've been meditating for 45, you know, even probably longer years. Have you noticed that you haven't aged as much as maybe people that you know who haven't meditated? Oh my goodness. 
I don't even know. When I go back to things like my high school class reunions, um, it's shocking to me. I mean, the truth is I'm not 120, but I am going to be 70. Mm -hmm. And um, I have no physical aches and pains, absolutely none. My mind is, you know, I teach success seminars and I have to pull up like quotes that I qu haven't quoted for 30, 40 years. And I could just pull them right up. And I absolutely believe that meditation has been key. I mean, I've been meditating every single day for uh, last year was my 50th anniversary of learning meditation. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind. And also it's been scientifically proven that when you meditate certain forms of meditation, not all, but certain forms of meditation, it actually releases the youthing hormone. Ronnie could explain the uh, science behind that much better than I can, but it um, but there have been volumes and volumes. Actually, I just have to brag on Ronnie for, for a second. The original research that was done at Harvard uh, in the 1990s, it was actually on the cover of Newsweek, Have We Found the Fountain of Youth? And it was all about meditation. Ronnie was part of that research. Fantastic, fantastic. So what is it about the meditation that actually slows down the aging process? Well, there are many aspects of that. Um, and the first thing to, I think I would point out is that the quote aging process, what we think of as aging, such as you know loss of muscle mass, um, shrinking of our, our brain, loss of you know those what Deborah called senior moments, these things are common. However, they're not biologically inevitable. There are things we can do that make a difference. And I'll just give you a few statistics. The human brain peaks at about, it continues to mature well past when we can vote, okay. up till about age 26 or 27. And then the human brain actually begins to atrophy. It starts to shrink. Huh. And the human brain starts shrinking at age 26 or 27. And by the time we hit 40, the human brain shrinks at 5% per decade, okay? Wow. 5% per decade, and this is common, but we do know that it is not biologically inevitable. That research at places like the UCLA Center for Neuroimaging, and there's over 100 studies now around the world that show that with meditation, we can slow, stall, and even reverse that deterioration, particularly in the area for those who are watching the TV, right here behind our forehead, which is the prefrontal cortex. It's the most evolved, sophisticated part of the human brain. It's responsible for our remarkable human intellect, our capacity to uh, have executive function, to plan, to be creative, to um, be ex have executive function. Um, and also it's Im implicated in our emotional life. And what, that was the research that Deborah was talking about that we did at Harvard, which was really probably the first study to show, we started the study in the 80s, so I'm dating myself as well. I'm only one year behind Deborah. Wow. And what we found is that even people in their 80s who were already in nursing homes because of physical and mental decline, that when they started meditating, and we had four different groups, several different kinds of meditation, and then a regular control group that didn't get anything, and what we found is that even people in nursing homes already, that their mental capacity increased, their cognitive abilities increased significantly just from learning the meditation. And at the same time, as if that's not good enough, they actually lived significantly longer, an average of 15. We did a meta-analysis, a big analysis. We followed these people for 15 years till they would have been 100. And what we found was that they were living significantly longer. They had 49% less cancers, 38% less cardiovascular disease, like 90% less cognitive decline. So it makes a huge difference if you do the practices because when we meditate, there's a whole cascade of biological changes that happen that promote longevity, protecting the telomeres. It's every aspect of our mind, body, spirit complex. Use it you don't lose it type of thing, or is that different? So do brain game exercises help and crossword puzzles and practices help 
as much as meditation or, or would meditation actually help more than those? Well, you know, the analogy I like to use for that is all of these things are incredibly valuable and you've hit on several of the six pillars for lifelong brain health because I just want to make sure everybody understands that it is possible to maintain a, a sharp, focused, functional, enjoyable, mental, cognitive state all the days of our lives, well into our 90s. It's totally possible. And what meditate and all of these things help. Mental stimulation, use it or lose it for sure. However, what the meditation does, it's like all of those things are seeds. And the meditation is the fertilizer that makes all of those seeds much more effective. Your computer can actually age you, <laughs> which is terrifying because that's how we spend most of our time now. Well, what is that? Okay. <laughs> Tell me. Do I want to know? Well, what Ronnie and I have been doing for the last, it's actually, I said a year and a half, it's been almost two years. We have really, we just dove in to researching what are the, what are the things that we do in our daily lives that age us most quickly and what can slow down and stop the aging process. And it blew our minds when we found out that the light that comes off of the screens of our computers and our tablets and our phones, which is called blue light, and it's known to have long-term health effects. But it's so mind-blowing. Even the health letter of the Harvard Medical School said just recently in July of 2020, that blue light has been shown to not only affect your sleep, but potentially cause diseases, not only headaches, but cancers, diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and studies suggest that continued exposure to blue light over time could lead to damage retinal cells and eventually to vision problems like age-related macular degeneration and even blindness. And blue light exposure, but listen to this, it's a special concern for children and especially really little ones because their developing eyes absorb more blue light from the computers than adults, putting them at even greater risk of long-term damage to their eyes. And I mean, look at, there are two and three-year-olds playing on tablets and computers and phones. And with online learning now, it's the norm. Some re researchers are saying that macular degeneration and blindness is going to be the biggest health crisis in industrialized nations when the young people who spend hours a day exposing their eyes to blue light become adults. So, and there's more. So just the solution, wearing blue light blocking glasses. Of course, I have my blue light blocking glasses. I don't have them on now because I gotta look pretty, but I have my <laughs> blue light blocking glasses. But I also have, you know, lots of times kids won't wear those glasses, but you can put a blue light blocking screen on your computer. Okay, really, okay. really important, even on your cell phone. If the kids are gonna be playing or you're looking at it, you do not wanna be destroying your retina or your macula. And there's something else. Now this is gonna blow your mind even more. There's one more important thing to share because this is about anti-aging. Blue light has also been shown to age the skin. So believe it or not, you should put a sun protector of at least SPF 40 if you're in front of the computer for long stretches of time and you don't want your skin to age. In fact, experts say protection from the sun's UVA and UVB rays is no longer the greatest threat to aging our skin, but rather this research is confirming that blue light emitted from our digital devices is equally or now more damaging to their skin. In fact, I have a quote. I actually have a quote. I Oh no, this is devastating. You. This is from dermatologist Stephanie Williams. I read this in Bizarre Magazine. Listen to what she said. We are now seeing increasing data on the potential long-term harms of blue light. Our digital devices are swiftly being label, labeled the silent agers of our generation. Yikes. Okay, now we need to know what to do to reverse this because this is uh, terrifying. I spent a year <laughs> in front of this thing. Um, tell me, um, I, if you can, what would be one of the best techniques to really, uh, you mentioned, Ronnie, breath. 
to help with the aging reversing process? The breath really can be a, an anti-aging superpower. So I'm glad you brought that up. And I'll give you a little bit of an explanation just how important it is, if I might. So we've already talked about how stress is the number one, or there's nothing worse than stress for aging the system. And that, um, in fact, when they wanna look at, at aging in the human body, scientists usually will take, or often will take caregivers of people with Alzheimer's because they're under so much stress and they watch how the body ages prematurely from external stress. So um, the stress response, you know, when we feel stressed, let's just talk a minute about stress. You know, when you feel stressed, let's say, I'll, I live in Florida, as we talked earlier, and I open the cabinet. I like to leave my front door open because I really like the, the fresh air, but I don't have a screen on my front door. And so critters can get in. And the other day I was happily preparing my lunch and I flung open the cabinet door and this gecko, this lizard flung out of the cabinet, apparently was on the inside of the door and it came flying out at me. And so what do you think happened to my breath? And I'm like, ah! right? And then when I realized that it was only a little lizard and it was not a Gila monster, then what happened to my breath, right? <laughs> So we see that our breath and our emotions are opposite sides of the same coin. And so we can either allow our emotions to change our breath, or we can use our breath to actually transform our emotional state. And why that's so important is, as I mentioned to you, um, that when we feel stressed, it, it basically destroys the system. So being able to have some control over our emotions provides a powerful window into our mind-body complex to allow us to settle back down. In fact, that, that I talked about, that's the fight or flight response. And that's part of our automatic or autonomic nervous system, the branch that's called the sympathetic. You can remember S for stress, S for sympathetic. And so when we're under stress, that stressful sympathetic nervous system jacks up. However, we're only intended to be that way for short periods of time, like when we have to save our life, like out swim a shark. Again, in Florida, out swim a shark. We're meant to be most of the time in the opposite branch of our automatic or autonomic nervous system, which is the peaceful, parasympathetic, restorative, regenerative, anti-aging part of our nervous system. That's where we're supposed to spend more of our time. Okay, but both of those branches, the, the peaceful parasympathetic and the stressful sympathetic, they rise and fall like two sides of a seesaw. When one is high, the other is low. But that automatic or autonomic nervous system is automatic. That's why I go, <gasps> it's not in our control. It controls everything that's involuntary, our heartbeat, our digestion, our perspiration, our tears, everything. And it's totally out of our control except for one function, and one function only, and that's our breath. The breath can be both, you know, involuntary, but it's also voluntary. We breathe fast, we breathe slow, we can hold our breath. And because of that, the breath forms a window into our automatic or autonomic nervous system and allows us to rapidly calm the stress response, increase the well being, peaceful parasympathetic response, and create what's called autonomic or automatic homeostasis where we live the longest. So the breath is a very powerful tool at allowing us to increase the longevity aspect of our nervous system. So this particular breath is called straw breath. And we teach it in um, to actually to gangs in the inner city. We teach it to people in prisons. We teach it in corporations because the nice thing about this breath is that when you're feeling stressed, like the first time I spoke at the United Nations, I was so nervous but I could do this breath and nobody could tell. It's called straw breath. And it goes like this. You simply um, breathe in normally through the nose. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna breathe out through the mouth, but pursing our lips like we're holding a straw. Like, you know, I mean, I honestly still do it with environmentally safe straws. You know how when you have a drink of something and you just can't resist instead of sucking up through the straw, blowing out through the straw and watching all the bubbles? <laughs> so that's what we're going to do in this breath. It's called straw breath. We breathe in through the nose, regular, normal breath, and then we purse our lips 
and we breathe out just a regular slow exhale. You breathe in through the nose, full breath. And then we purse our lips and breathe out through the straw. And all of our listeners can do that, even people who are driving, because they should definitely do it with their eyes open. So we're gonna breathe in through the straw, in through the nose, and out through the straw. And if, if you are in a situation where you can, you can close your eyes, it's even more relaxing. And out through the straw. And let's just do six or seven of them. And it, so it stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. And I want you all to experience this. Now, what about, a, and that, of course, lowers the stress levels, which we talked about earlier, which would lengthen the telomeres if you do it enough times. A good practice. How um, often do you do something like that? You can do it 10 times a day if you're in a really stressed situation. I mean, it's good to do... You know, these things are really great to do as a preventative, you know, rather than just waiting till the, you know, the, the drama or the tragedy or the stress hits, because it makes the system more resilient over time. So um, I recommend that people do it at least twice a day. You know, you can do it for two minutes twice a day. And, you know, anytime, like if you're stuck in traffic, instead of getting aggravated, just and it'll calm you down, or if you have a presentation at work, or um, you're nervous about taking an exam, or any time. I just wanted to add something that this straw breath, as Ronnie said, that you can do it any time. You could be in a board meeting, or you could be in a meeting with attorneys, or whatever, high stress. Nobody sees you if you're, if you're doing straw breath, but it really brings you back to your center. You know, you're feeling like you want to just like explode. And when you do this, it brings you back to your center and you see things more clearly. However, for the long term, what Ronnie has taught me is that it also um, gets rid of brain inflammation. And doesn't it also, Ronnie, even thicken the prefrontal cortex doing breathing techniques? Breathing techniques, yes. This particular technique, straw breath, there's not specific data on this technique, which is why, you know, I mean, we could talk for three months to the people here and we couldn't give them all of the information. So um, yeah, breathing techniques are really a su an anti-aging superpower because breathing in different rhythms and different patterns for different lengths of time with different intensity makes a huge difference. Even with breathing practices, it's such a, a specific science. It's actually the first science probably in the world to recognize the relationship between our mind, our body, and our emotions and how they all affect each other. The yogic science of breath is, the, is probably the first science to recognize that and to provide specific tools for both restoration of health and prevention of disease and um, extension of, of quality of life. So yeah, breathing is really important because there's the inhalation, there's the exhalation, and whether or not you hold the breath before the inhale or after the inhale or before the exhale or after the exhale, all of these things make a huge difference in the stressful sympathetic and peaceful parasympathetic and how they balance out and then the chemicals that they release in the rest of the body. Yeah, so the apparently you have a whole ebook about this. Maybe Deborah, you can tell us about it, which I'm really grateful for that we're able to share. If you see on the bottom of our screens, you'll see the website there that you can get uh, this ebook, and it's free for everyone to read about. Tell us a little bit about it. So you've packed a lot into this. <laughs> yes. Well, as I said, we have a lot more to share today about different areas, different things that people could do in terms of exercise, in terms of diet. We want to share a lot more, but we realized in one hour we couldn't, we couldn't fit it all in. I mean, we teach weekend courses on it. 
So what we decided to do is to create a book where we, it's an ebook, where we take some of the most compelling ways that you can slow down and reverse the aging process and uh, with the scientific research that supports it, but we also give very specific things that people can do. It's not just theoretical. It's this is what you can do in this area. This is what you can do in this area. And um, it's all uh, scientifically supported. So uh, the, the book is called Ancient, and, and it is. It's because we share ancient, like Ayurvedic secrets, ancient and modern secrets for um, lifelong radiance. And that's what we want. We don't want you to just live. We want you to live radiantly mm. for a long time. It's yeah. about the quality of life and also how your brain is functioning. And there's so many different stressors that are going that's going on in our life right now. People think that it's their brain misfiring and it's not. It's just that it's full. I mean the CPUs are full <laughs> trying to negotiate COVID and should we wear the masks and the, all the whole thing. It's all so much that's constantly the undercurrent of our lives now that making simple decisions or remembering where you left the keys that you're not using is difficult. So yeah, that is, that's great. So it helps with everything, long-term memory, short-term memory, when you really start. So is, is that the case? So when you start to work on one thing, you really start to impact the brain and the body and everything else? Yeah. Yes. Well, I was going to say another area, and I have to, there's no way I'm going to pass this by because it's your favorite area of life, Lise. Exercise. Yay! <laughs> it is, it is. I uh, love that. There is compelling research that's concluded that there are now two types of exercise that can slow the aging process by preventing cellular aging. And you might be surprised to hear what they are, and they, it, it is not yoga. Okay. <laughs> Believe it or not, one is hit high intensity interval training. Yay! Right? And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a it's a um it's a type of cardiovascular exercise that combines like short bursts of intense exercise with periods of rest or lower intensity exercise, and then the short burst again. So that's one. And the second is endurance training, also called aerobic exercise, which Lisa will be happy to know, includes activities like anything that brings your heart rate up, like, you know, power walking, jogging, swimming, and biking. <laughs> that's my favorite thing. And you'll find this interesting. Um, there was a, because speaking of telomeres, there was a study recently published in the European Heart Journal where researchers examined the effects of different types of exercise over a six month period. They had 125 participants and most of the participants were instructed to do either high um, endurance training, HIT, high intensity interval, or resistance training. Resistance is like weights or machines or resistance band or their own weight. And what they found at the end of six months was that high intensity intervals and endurance training, but not resistance training, huh. increased the telomere activity. So again, as Ronnie said, telomeres are those nucleotide sequences found at the end of our chromosomes. And when they shorten, aging occurs, and high intensity interval training and endurance training, aerobic, were um, were found to, yeah, aerobic, um, were found to increase telomere length, thus producing an anti-aging effect. So again, it is um, high intensity and then endurance, also called aerobic. Go for that, and it will that turn back the hands of time. Well, good to know. And Ronnie, I actually would love to ask you about diet. In what oh. types of foods, what types of diets do you recommend? Vegetarian, paleo, keto, does it matter? I mean, for the aging process? Well, you know, obviously junk food is not good. There, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you can read books and books about diet. The one thing that I think it's important to, to uh, accentuate that most people may not be very aware of is one of the most important aspects of diet is, is uh, nourishing our gut biome. 
or the bacteria in our gut. That is one of the most important things because our, our microbiome is a community of life supporting microbes that live in the gut and they play a major, a pivotal role actually in our health and happiness. And there are literally trillions and trillions of bacteria that live in the gut and our overall health as well as our longevity of our bodies and our brains is intimately tied with this gut microbiome. In fact, some people are now aware that 50% of our antibodies from our immune system are produced in our gut. And you'd probably be surprised to know that 90%, again, 90% of the chemicals that are circulating in our bodies aren't produced by our body cells, but they're produced by microbiome especially those in the gut. And so it's really important that we nourish the gut bacteria because there's been a huge imbalance in the gut bacteria currently. And one of the things that imbalances it is stress. And so nutrition is really important for the gut biome because they have no choice but to eat what we eat. You know, so our choices are essential. And our gut bacteria, to answer your question, they rely on fiber from fruits and vegetables as a source of energy. And when they metabolize that fiber, they produce short chain fatty acids, which are vital compounds that regulate our immune system. They reduce inflammation. And incidentally, all disease is now, inflammation is considered the root cause of all disease and for rapid aging of the body. So it's really important to reduce inflammation by providing for a healthy gut biome Obviously, we know the importance of our immune system at this time. And uh, people should understand that the, the biotic or the biome has to be nourished by what we call prebiotics, which is the fiber from the fruits and vegetables. And I can just mention a couple of things that no matter what diet you have, that it's a really important. Things like asparagus and leeks and garlic and bananas and apples and oats and chicory root. And of course, my favorite, which is jicama, which is Mexican yam, which for those of you who haven't tried it, it's a godsend. It's crunchy like a radish, but it's sweet. And so these are the things that in terms of diet, you want to stay with. And it's very telling to know what to avoid because what throws the gut biome out of whack are antibiotics, pesticides on conventionally grown fruits and vegetables and grains, and the typical Western diet, which is high in fat, low in fiber, depleted of fiber actually, and very high in sugar. So every time we choose a mango, I just want picking mangoes, it's mango season here. Mm. Every time I choose a mango or a donut, or Deborah's passion, every time I choose a non-toxic home product instead of um, the, you know, the ones that you see on TV, yeah. you're supporting your health span, mm -hmm. which is the years of life that you live healthy and on top of your game. And avoid what you know to be bad and, and love those gut bacteria. Give them the food that they need because we don't like to be hungry and neither does our gut biome. I, Ronnie, I mean, is it important to eat fats? Is it uh, an important part of the aging, anti-aging yeah. process? Oh yeah, well, the thing about fats is that all fats are not created equal. It's very important to have healthy fats. We know about the omegas, which are essential for our brain health. However, certain fats, like from refined oils, certain fats are pro-inflammatory. They cause inflammation and inflammation speeds up the aging process. Certain oils are anti-inflammatory, means they, they slow down and can even halt many aspects of the aging process so that the healthy fats are things like olive oil um, is a really good one. Coconut oil, there's some debate about because it is a saturated fat, but it seems to have very a lot of salutary effects on our system. The one thing that you want to avoid is fats that are pro-inflammatory, which are things like safflower oil, canola oil. Canola oil is the worst. Safflower oil, canola oil, these kinds of oils. And you want to make sure that you get cold pressed extra virgin oils. Because, you know, at first I thought, what is, what is extra virgin? You're either a virgin or you're not. But extra virgin means it's the first press of the olives or whatever the nut is. 
It's that first press of nuts. Walnut oil, by the way, is also very good. It's that first press of the nuts, so it's highest in the antioxidants and the other beneficials. It also means that it's not heated because the way that most oil is processed, commercial oil that you buy in the supermarket, is it's heated, which makes it toxic. And it, even if it's olive oil, it can be toxic olive oil, unless it's cold pressed extra virgin. And they also extract it rather than um, with a press, it's much cheaper to extract the oil with a chemical called hexane, which is toxic to humans. I learned this um, from a friend of mine from Brazil, where they eat avocado as a dessert because it's a fruit. They think it's weird that we put it in our salads. So um, if you mash avocado with lemon, and a little bit of sweetener. Um, I, you can use stevia, you can use a little bit of xylitol. Um, you can, coconut sugar is good, date sugar is great. Stay away from white sugar, stay away from Splenda. Don't get me started on that one. Okay. But if you do that and if you mash it, it is so heavenly. And I make, um, I make a pie crust and I mash it and I put it in the pie crust and then you don't even cook it. And it's, it's sort of like an avocado version of key lime pie. It is delicious. It's healthy, it goes down really well, it's really quick to make, it's amazing. I, I grow the trees, I have avocado trees and I start oh. them from this giant pit in our hillside, I would just throw all the avocado pits that I would eat and throw them in there. And prior to that, I had, um, I was given an avocado tree, like a little starter tree to plant and I planted it and it died. And that always made me so sad. So then I created this pig pit in my yard. I kept throwing all the avocado trees that I, I uh, pits that I was eating in there. And I would just keep churning it and watering it. And now I have 12 avocado trees that are growing in this circumference of this area. And this is what I learned. Avocado trees have families. They need a mother and a father, and then they have babies, literally. One will not grow alone they need a spouse in order to pollinate and then they have babies and then they stay together. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Is Actually, that I, I wanted to add something to what Ronnie said. Um, one of the other things that we need to be sure that we cut out are inflammatory foods. Um, one of the things that I've learned from Ronnie is about brain inflammation and, and it's one of the greatest causes of brain deterioration. And there are so many things that cause inflammation in the brain, but there's one food more than any other that causes brain inflammation, which starts us being unclear. Where did I leave my keys? You know, you're trying to get, get organized in your brain and get your work done and you can't. And that is white sugar. So mm -hmm. if people are not going to do anything else that we ever suggest, if you just cut out white sugar, and as Ronnie said, you could substitute it with stevia, not Truvia or Previa, those are all chemically extracted, we won't go into that, but like some good organic, um, Sweet Leaf is a good brand, stevia, and start using that, or date sugar, or coconut sugar, xylitol is okay, just not too much, or it could give you a little bit of a diarrhea type of thing, but if you just eliminate that, and your next step could be eliminating refined carbohydrates because they turn into sugar, you, you, and things like alcohol, it doesn't mean you can't have a, a glass of wine for dinner, but you no, know, too much alcohol, processed foods, they all cause brain inflammation. But what you want to do is you want to increase the foods that actually fight brain inflammation like Ronnie says, avocados, walnuts, and um, vegetarian, non-vegetarian, grass-fed meats are not that bad. Free-range chickens are not that bad. But of course, you, you want to um, have the extra virgin olive oil and all of that. And um, Blueberries? Are mention, blueberries good? Yes, and that's the other thing. The other, we didn't talk about oxidation. You know what oxidation is. It's um, when your skin gets old and wrinkly, that's oxidation from, this, from the sun. Another visual of it, if you cut an apple and the apple turns brown, that's because some of the electrons have been um, um, cut off and they go searching for another electron. 
And anyway, so the apple turns brown, that's oxidation. That's what happens to your skin. And, um, but if you put lemon juice on it, it doesn't turn brown. So there are some things that oxidize and there are some things that are antioxidants. So if you want your skin to be beautiful and radiant and healthy, you eat antioxidant foods. And some of those foods are just eat the rainbow, you know, red peppers and, and, and orange peppers and, and blueberries, like you say, and bright green kale, just the brighter, the better. You'll see it on the cover of our ebook. When you get our oh. ebook, you'll see a picture of all the rainbow of foods that are all antioxidants. They fight oxidation in your body. Good to know. So once again, you can check that ebook out at the bottom of my screen here, you'll see the, the link. And also for those of you that are listening, if you go to the website, which is yes to success.com forward slash ageless hyphen ebook hyphen Lisa. <laughs> Got that? Yes to success.com forward slash ageless hyphen ebook hyphen Lisa. And you can check that out on the the ebook there. It's it's beautifully done. It all this information and more of what we're talking about that is scientifically validated is all in there. And I can't tell you how perfect the two of you are to talk about this because you both are amazing, 70, and really the picture of health and happiness and your brains. Now I do have a question for you, um, Ronnie, about fatigue. So other than getting great sleep, is there a breath exercise that you can do for clarity, for fighting fatigue, if you're in the middle of you know, needing to focus? Is there a good one for that? Maybe Deborah knows that too. One of you might know yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, one of them that's a great energizer is called um, Bellows Breath or Bostrica. And we can, we can um, easily show you that one. The one caveat about that is that if you're pregnant um, or you have macular degeneration, you wanna do it, or uncontrolled high blood pressure, you wanna do it very, very gently. I'll describe it for the people who are driving. You start with your elbows at your side, your arms at your side, your elbows bent and your palms facing forward. And you close your fists, and we're on the inhale, we're going to raise our arms and open up our fists like this. And here, you can see my fingers. We open them up on the inhale. And on the exhale, we close our fist. And we just allow gravity to let our arms drop. And we like to chicken, you know, you bang, you let them come against your side, which is why it's called a bellow. You know, in the old days, the bellows would be like this. And it floods the, the brain with oxygen. It's a great, great energizer. A friend of mine used to say that um, where he worked that people would go out for a, a cigarette break and he would go around the other side of the building for a breath break. Um, we breathe in and out through the nose, full breath. So we take a breath in through the nose, transition breath, and we breathe out through the mouth. And then now we're gonna breathe in and out through the nose. So on the inhale, we go up and open the palms and then on the exhale, we close the fist and let the arms drop. Inhale up, exhale down. All through the nose. Inhale up, exhale down. Inhale up, exhale down. Up, down. Up, down. Up, down. Up, down. Up, down. And relax, let the palms be on the lap facing the ceiling. I love us doing this. <laughs> yeah, it's a great energizer. I just have to tell you, Ronnie and I, about 10 years ago, we were in India together again. And um, it's one of the techniques that they teach through the art of living. And we were with um, 3 million people doing Bellows Breath together. So you think it's fun doing three of us? Three million all in sync. There are these big screen TVs for miles and we all did the breath together. Oh my yeah. God, that's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. So it was it was just through the nose that you're doing this or was it? Yes. Oh, okay. In and out through the nose. I can't talk through my nose, which is why I was opening my mouth. Right, Perfect. right, so that's great. <laughs> okay, and so what you can do up and down counts as one. So you can do 15. And then you let, take a rest and allow the heartbeat to come back to normal. 
then you can do a second round of 15 and a third round of 15. And the one thing is you don't want to do it too close to bed because it's very energizing. Yeah, that's and, great. And it's it's good to do on an empty, you know, not not after a lasagna and a milkshake. Right. Ooh, yeah. So what <laughs> yeah. about that sleep thing? When you are having a hard time sleeping or want to get to sleep and can't sleep in the middle of the night, is there a good breath exercise for sleep? The, the very good one is the straw breath that we just did. Okay. All right. Good to know. So you can just do that several times and put yourself right to sleep. I love it. Oh, that's right. great. All right. You yeah. know, there's another thing about sleep. And that is that when you do this, the stress management, whether it's the meditation or the breath, and Deborah and I do both every day, we've made a commitment to it, then you naturally are able to sleep better because one of the things is that the stress hormone cortisol suppresses the production of melatonin. And melatonin is the hormone that allows you to sleep. So people, even um, when we teach the, there's a particular practice, we teach the bellows breath and we teach the, um, straw breath, but we teach another very powerful technique called Sudarshan Kriya um, through our foundation. We teach it in prisons. And what a very common response from the prison inmates is that for the first time since they were incarcerated, they're able to sleep through the night. Sudarshan Kriya, unfortunately, we can't show you right now mm -hmm. because it takes several hours to learn, but it's, it's a certain breathing practice where you breathe in different rhythms of the breath with different intensities, and it powerfully resets the entire um, autonomic nervous system. It lowers cortisol from the very first session. And when you're talking about antioxidants, it also increases the body's natural production of antioxidants. Because everybody should know that we have our own internal pharmacy that produces antioxidants. And when we are stressed, it suppresses the production of antioxidants. Speeds up aging because it reduces the number of antioxidants, which means that we rust like a bicycle. A bicycle rusting is oxidative stress. So we rust like a bicycle more quickly. They want to learn the Siddharshan Kriya, Kriya they, breath. They can just go to artofliving.org. And they, because you do have to learn it through a class. So you go to artofliving.org and you look up Sky Siddharshan Kriya Yoga is this breath practice but it's the acronym is SKY. So you just look up SKY and they're teaching it online. So anybody could learn it wherever you are. I yeah. have heard of that. And I have wondered what the SKY breath practice is. Yeah. Honestly, it is the best kept secret. I've been doing research in mind body medicine for 40 years now. And you already know how old I am. So you don't have to do the math. <laughs> and it literally is the single best kept secret I have ever found because, you know, even Deborah and I are meditation, certified meditation teachers. We have been for many years and we're the greatest proponents of meditation. And yet when people are really, really, really agitated, sometimes they say, how can I sit and meditate um, like this? But we can always attend to the breath and the breath always brings us back to center. And when it comes to anti-aging, we're, right there about the breath is probably the single most important thing that we could pay attention to for our stress levels, aging process, everything. I just thank you so much. You both are both vibrant and so eager to share and so much information that you are willing to give. Um, again, so are there anything else that you want to just end with or tell me we just have like a minute left? I would like to say one thing that's really important when we talk about anti-aging, it's really important to begin these things in our 20s and 30s and not wait till we see signs of it because brain deterioration, as we said, starts in our 20s. And by the time you have trouble remembering somebody's name, there's brain deterioration has already occurred. Muscle mass and muscle strength, which we all love, we want to be strong and vital, starts decreasing at age 30 at about three to 8% per decade. And by the time we hit 60, it declines even more rapidly. And I could say the same about many of the other functions that keep us young and healthy and happy and vital. So the sooner you start these things, the better. Today would be the ideal day to start some of it. There is absolutely no reason to not do these things because you have the rest of your life ahead of you. And this will definitely make the rest of your life more vibrant, healthier, happier, and your brain much more sharp and clear, which is what we all want.
Right. So it doesn't matter how old we are. Well, thank you so much, ladies. I really appreciate this. And thank you for the information in the ebook. Again, if you can go to the website, which is yes to success.com forward slash ageless hyphen ebook hyphen Lisa. That is it for me today. I am Lisa Gar. And until next time, I invite you to stay aware. Thank you.